That, insert famous company name here, <laughs> is definitely not a pyramid scheme. I'm a part of it, I've done really well off it. This video is brought to you by Simon's new pyramid scheme. Go to businessblaze.com forward slash Simon's pyramid scheme to get started today. Link below and let's get into it. It's another episode of Business Blaze. As always, I'm Simon. I read these scripts and add some comments that maybe are funny. Danny writes it. This one is all about that time the pyramid schemes caused a civil war. So let's just jump right into it, shall we? Uh, in today's video, we'll be looking at how a pyramid scheme ended up causing a civil war in Albania in 1997. Although it's arguable that the schemes in question were technically pyramid schemes, and it's debatable whether the dramatic outcome was te technically a civil war. But stick with me, I'm pretty sure the country and the year are both, are both bang on. Sorry, Danny. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes I come across ideas, and I'm like, yeah, I, I think I saw like a Wikipedia article about a civil war caused by pyramid schemes somewhere. And it's like... <laughs> Daddy comes back and he's like, yes, yeah, Simon, it turns out it wasn't a pyramid scheme. I'm like, shut up, Daddy, write the script. And so he does. <laughs> Thanks, Daddy. But what exactly is a pyramid scheme anyway? In an eight-edged and five-faced nutshell, it's an inevitably doomed business model in which the people at the top often walk away with millions, while the people at the bottom often get royally screwed over. And this is another one of those videos where it's like, I'm sure everyone has companies in their minds right now. And you're like, yeah, it's a pyramid scheme. I certainly do. I'm not going to mention any of them because those guys are litigious. <laughs> However, that could possibly describe pretty much any corporate business environment today. <laughs> so we'll go into a little bit more detail. Very good. The general idea is that new members of a pyramid scheme are regularly recruited and are required to pay an often substantial upfront fee to become a part of the pyramid. These new members are then required to go on their own recruitment drive for new members, with all the membership fees getting dished out to the people above them in the pyramid. And this is always one of those things, if anyone has ever gone like, a friend from the past, maybe went to school with someone and they're like, hey, on Facebook, just wondering if we could catch up and get a coffee. And then you sit down, it's like, I've got this great opportunity, great business opportunity to tell you about. That's a pyramid scheme. <laughs> So let's say, for example, that Shifty Stephen, I was going to say Simon, but we'll go with Stephen. Thanks, Danny. I'm not running a pyramid scheme, but you know, if you're at the top, it's pretty good business. <laughs> it's so massively unethical. Shifty Stephen decides to build his own pyramid scheme. He recruits 10 members to his scheme who all have to pay Shifty Stephen a fee for the privilege of joining. In order to get their investment back, back these 10 tier 2 members each have to recruit 10 new members to create their own third tier. The membership fees collected from these 100 tier 3 members are then paid to the 10 tier 2 members who also pay a percentage back to Shifty Steven because he's on the top of the pyramid up there on tier 1. And so it goes on and on with the building of new tiers and new members who keep funneling fresh supplies of money up the pyramid, in theory anyway. Yeah, this is all well and good. Except there is a problem where that, you know, if you're at 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, uh, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 million, really quickly, you're gonna get up to like everyone on earth <laughs> and, and then it's not gonna work. The problem with the pyramid scheme, of course, is the shape of them. In order for a pyramid to work, it would have to expand indefinitely as each new tier would be significantly bigger than the tier above it, exactly 10 times bigger, assuming everyone recruits 10 people. Even the most successful pyramid scheme in the history of mankind is ultimately destined to fail, as it turns out the population of planet Earth is finite. Oh my God, what? At some point, those new recruits are inevitably destined to dry up and the whole pyramid will collapse from a lack of fresh investment, keeping it going. Okay, yes, like I always say, you should read these things ahead. The few people who are lucky enough to be near the very top of the pyramid have made their fortune. Shifty Stephen will most likely have changed his identity and fled to Hawaii with his millions of dollars. But there's another problem with the shape of the pyramid. The overwhelming majority of the members will be at the much bigger bottom end of the pyramid, and the people in the bottom tier are not going to get their investment back when the whole thing topples to dust. Yeah, I mean, because of course the money's got to come from somewhere. The comforting thing about pyramid schemes is that anyone who loses money from them probably deserves everything they get for being such a buffoon to sign up to them in the first place. I agree, but these things are also designed. They really are, like their whole thing. Like the guys on top know that this is the barrier they have to get past. And you know, whatever you want to say, the guys on the top are probably quite smart. And they're like, okay, well, how do we just get around all of these objections that people have? Like they call it a pyramid scheme. We got an answer to that. And then they hook people in. The whole thing is hooking people in. I feel, you know, I don't think it's their fault. I mean, sometimes it is. <laughs> But then it's like, if someone's really dumb, is it their fault? Shouldn't we protect those dumb people? I'm like generally <laughs> like quite a capitalist. But yeah, this is where the government really needs to step in and be like, stop that shit. 
Okay. But when is a pyramid scheme not quite a pyramid scheme? Well, that's when it's a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi schemes I know a little bit about, because I've made videos about Bernie Madoff and Charles Ponzi, the original Ponzi scheme dude. If you want to see those, they're on my biographics channel, but don't watch them yet. You've got to watch this video first, because that watch time, where you watch all of the video, that matters to me. And it matters to the YouTube algorithm. Like, all that liking and shit and commenting, none of that really matters. Just watch to the end. That would be awesome. And although the 1997 Civil War of Albania is often attributed to the collapse of pyramid schemes, partly because pyramid schemes were popular in Albania at that time anyway, it was actually the collapse of Ponzi schemes that sparked the crisis. Ah, oh, okay, so here it is. This was, uh... Yeah, no, it's not about pyramids. <laughs> Essentially, Ponzi schemes work in a way similar to pyramid schemes, but with a couple of crucial differences. For starters, members don't actually know they're inside a pyramid. Although, to be fair, I'm not sure that people who are inside pyramid schemes know they're inside a pyramid scheme. They'll be like, oh, Simon, uh, you know, we've made videos about pyramid scheme people, and they're like, oh, no, that's multi level marketing. It's a completely different thing. Where well, it's really kind of the same, where it's like, oh, no, no, no. That insert famous company name here <laughs> is definitely not a pyramid scheme. I'm a part of it. I've done really well off it. And if you want to get a copy, <laughs> you're in a pyramid scheme. Whereas pyramid schemes are at least relatively honest about the shape of their business model and the fact that no product or sales are involved, a Ponzi scheme is a complete scam in which new members are led to believe that they're investing in a legitimate business which will yield higher returns. This is the famous example. Bernie Madoff would be the famous example here, and you can use him as an example, because he's in jail. <laughs> Uh, basically, it's where, hey, um, invest money in my company, people invest money, the interest rate is super high, but all of the interest is coming from the money that's coming in. Not really legitimate investments. I don't know why I'm saying this, because I'm absolutely certain, in about two minutes, Danny's going to explain it to us anyway. The alleged nature of the business is often described in a way that sounds impressive, but is unlikely to make much sense to the new investor. Hedges future trading, offshore reversed income, uh, adjustable rate double top prize board banking, that kind of thing. Those, it's like, yeah. <laughs> Hedges future trading does legitimately sound like a thing. I know Danny's made it up, but I'll be like, yeah, I guess they know what they're doing. It's actually harder work for the founder. Whereas Shifty Steven could just sit back after a while and let the pyramid grow, that's not possible with a Ponzi scheme because new recruits aren't expected to find further new recruits. They're not even aware that the new investments are the only way of keeping the dodgy scheme alive. Instead, it's left to the founder to find new investors or encourage more investment from existing members of the scheme. This fresh money is then used to pay the regular high yield returns to all the members of the scheme who are fooled into believing that the money comes from business profits. Okay, just like I said. Double explanation. Maybe it's useful. It's slightly confusing. While it's harder work on this level, it's possibly easier to attract more investment this way as the business sounds more legit than a pyramid scheme, even though the whole thing is built on the foundations of dishonesty. And this is what I feel was really the difference between like Bernie Madoff and like XYZ Pyramid Scheme Company. Because XYZ Pyramid Scheme Company is like, you know, it, it just seems a bit dodgy. You know, you're kind of selling to your friends. Whereas if you were with Bernie Madoff, you're like, Bernie Madoff is a hugely successful Wall Street dude who's getting great returns. He's the sort of person that I would, and like, I'd never, I, I'd never get involved in a Ponzi scheme because I'd be like, uh, in a pyramid scheme because it'd be like, guys, it's a pyramid. Whereas you'd be like Bernie Madoff, he's legit, yeah. What was it, 11% a year? 12% a year? I'll take it, and he can't be a scammer. It's Bernie Madoff. Or maybe I just think I'm smarter than I am, and then in a few years, I'll be inviting all you guys to, you know, join my pyramid scheme. But in a similar way to the pyramid scheme, the scheme is entirely reliant on new money flooding in from members. In this case, as soon as the flow of new cash slows down, even just very slightly, the founder will be unable to continue paying those high yield returns to everyone, which will in turn lead to members demanding their own original investments back. The whole thing collapses, by which time the founder has usually scarpered with what's left of the money, unless you're Bernie Madoff again. Or I mean, I also often feel like with the with these guys, it's like they just keep it going until they get caught. Leaving clean rather than with a 170-year jail sentence is, is a little bit rarer. Uh, when are we getting into the war, Danny? <laughs> or whatever the war wasn't. <laughs> Naturally, pyramid schemes and Ponzi schemes have a bit of a tendency to ignite outrage in the unfortunate souls who lost money to them. Some particularly angry people have even been known to put pen to paper and complain to their local MP. <laughs> this is the most British joke ever, I love it. Like, uh, MP in the UK for our international audience is like a member of parliament, and writing a letter to your local MP to complain about some big issue that they can never do anything about is like the most middle class thing in the world. It's like when you've finally run out of real problems. <laughs> but nothing quite compared 
compares to the fallout from the collapse of several Albanian Ponzi schemes in 1997, which led to six months of civil disorder, economic turmoil, the resignation of the president, and the deaths of 2,000 citizens. Oh my god, I should probably stop making jokes. Up until the 1990s, Albania had spent five decades under communist dictatorship rule. There was little concept of private ownership, as everything was very much publicly owned. There was little concept of international trading, as the dictatorship believed in isolated self-sufficiency, and there wasn't even much of a concept of good banking. Yeah, things that make an economy work. No international trade and terrible banks. It's always been great! Most banks struggle to perform even the most basic of functions, with even relatively simple transfers of money taking up to 15 days to complete. By 1992, the dictatorship had been toppled, and the Democratic Party of Albania won the first free elections to ever be held in the nation. The new president, Sali Berisha, promised a brighter future for Albania, embracing a market economy and launching sweeping economic and democratic reforms. But Albania's complete inexperience with capitalism and financial investment led to the proliferation of a series of Ponzi schemes which promised much but ultimately delivered disaster for the population. Yeah, it's like the nature of a Ponzi scheme. It's like, yeah, you're gonna get like 10% return. It's not gonna end well. It's often been suggested that the Albanian government endorsed many of these new Ponzi schemes in full knowledge that they were scams. Whilst I've not been able to uncover any evidence of blatant official endorsements, it's certainly true to say that the government turned a blind eye to what was going on and completely ignored stark warnings from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to close down these fraudulent institutions. Couple of points here. I do feel like in that transition period, after communism or whatever, plenty of shifty stuff goes on related between business and government, and I wouldn't, you know, obviously haven't looked this up at all, but I wouldn't be surprised if the government was in on it. You see like, oh yeah, the government endorses it, so people are like, oh yeah, it must be okay if the government's saying it's all right, because we can trust them right. No. <laughs> or very soon after communism, new capitalist government. Probably don't trust those guys 100%. <laughs> Pro tip, Cuba and North Korea, when you eventually go the direction that everyone goes. In the meantime, the number of Ponzi schemes began to mushroom through the 1990s, competing with each other by offering increasingly ludicrous claims of high monthly returns on investments. Monthly returns? That's a worry. At their peak, some of the major players were offering a monthly, monthly, 40% interest rate on new investments, which is around the same time that Albania got gripped by Ponzi mania. Like, I understand, like, 11% with Bernie Madoff, you could be like, wow, that's incredible, but believable, just about. Whereas 40% a month, which, I don't know, is at least 480 a year, assuming it compounds, you're gonna be way up there. Way up there, assuming you reinvest all of your money, which of course they want you to do, because if you draw it out, it's all gonna fall. It's just unbelievable. It's just, there's no way. A huge chunk of the population sold their homes and farms to ensure that they wouldn't miss out on the opportunity of a lifetime, with queues stretching for miles outside the offices of the companies offering these too-good-to-be-true deals. By January 1997, an estimated 1.2 billion had been invested in these schemes from a population of just 3 million people. That's a pretty staggering figure, especially when you consider that equates to about $400 per head in a population where the average monthly wage at the time was $80. This is really sad. These f Bilk to these people. You think like those, you know, post-communist Russian oligarchs who made themselves billionaires on the selling of like government assets, not government assets, but like the, um, oh, what the hell are they called? They're like tickets. Um, whatever it was. You think those guys are bad? These guys are worse. Inevitably, this was the point where the supply of fresh money had been exhausted because pretty much everyone was already invested. The schemes collapsed under their own weight, the founders fled the scene, the people of Albania were denied access to their investments, and the whole Albanian economy was plunged into crisis. No surprise. Thousands of protesters took to the streets to demand their money back from the government, who believed that they had been complicit with the Con Ponzi schemes. A state of emergency was declared in March as government lost control of major cities to criminal gangs and rebels. See, that's, that's sounding pretty civil war-y. Uh, it's believed that around 2,000 citizens were killed in the riots and a further 5,000 wounded, mostly during shootouts between rival gangs in the wrestle to seize power of the country. That's intense. Just have a moment to think like how important a functional financial system is, because if it collapses, gangs take over and the military has to get involved. Law and order were only fully restored later in the year when the United Nations military forces arrived in the country, and Sally Berisha reluctantly stepped down as president to be replaced by socialist Mekseb Mediani. Couple of things there. One, the UN military had to get involved. That's incredible, like incredibly bad. 
um, to take to take the country back from gangs. And also, like, I fully understand why these people would vote for this super socialist guy. If your first experience of capitalism was that, uh, even I would vote for a socialist. Whether this crisis was a full-blown civil war, or a rebellion, or anarchy, or a period of civil unrest is open to interpretation. But the Albanian population suffered the consequences for years to come, and nobody got their money back. Although some of the Ponzi scheme founders were caught and sentenced to prison, it's believed that millions of those missing dollars could still be hiding away in foreign banks around the world with little chance of recovery. I bet they are. Bonus facts. Love some bonus facts. Number one. We're already at like 15 minutes? Thanks, Danny. Effort. Ponzi schemes got their name from the Italian swindler Charles Ponzi, who moved to the US in the early 20th century. Ponzi's original scheme in the 1920s was raking in millions of dollars a day during its peak, even prompting Ponzi to invest in legitimate business, but too late to save the collapse of the scheme. The fall of the Ponzi scheme brought down six banks with it and cost unlucky investors a total of $20 million in 1920s dollars, or about $250 million in today's money. Charles Ponzi served three years in prison for that. That's not bad. Is it Bernie, Bernie Madoff in prison forever? And this is the one is named the dude is named after. But he didn't learn from his mistakes. Upon release, he went through cycles of changing his identity, swindling massive fortunes from unsuspecting investors, living the life of Riley for a while, and then getting banged up again. Despite being one of the richest men in the world at the height of his fraudulent activities, he spent the last few years of his life in poverty and died in a charity hospital in Brazil. Uh, I've actually done a full video about Charles Ponzi on my biographics channel. I'm not going to link to it below, but if you Google, if you YouTube search Charles Ponzi, biographics, you'll find it. Number two, Charles Ponzi was such a swindler that he didn't really even invent the scheme that was destined to be named after him. A previous scheme called the Ladies Deposit had already done business, had already done it in the US in the 1880s, styling itself as a savings bank exclusively for unmarried women. The founder was former fortune teller Sarah Ho. Yeah, it's like always, that's who I look for to start my, you know, <laughs> when I'm looking for good investment opportunities, I look for former fortune tellers, not former investment bankers or anything like that, fortune tellers. <laughs> Although, you know, judging on how well, those guys predict the stock market sometimes. May as well be fortune tellers. <laughs> and they, she served three years in prison before being released to carry out exactly the same trick again in the name of the Women's Bank. Okay, I'm starting to understand why Bernie Madoff got so long in prison because it's like, yeah, these guys don't learn their lessons. It's like, oh, you know a way to make money really easily and you only go to jail for three years? She returned to fortune telling shortly before her death in 1892. Before that, a similar scheme had been launched in Germany in the 1860s, but even before that, the idea for such a scheme had appeared in the works of Charles Dickens, including his 1844 novel, Martin Chuzzlewit. Never heard of it. So now you know who's really to blame for the Albanian Civil War. Charles Dickens. Definitely Charles Dickens. This has been Business Blaze. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to sign up to my new pyramid scheme, just go to businessblaze.com forward slash Simon's Pyramid Scheme. Just kidding. I don't even own businessblaze.com. I'm sorry to whoever owns that domain. <laughs> don't go there. Don't do a pyramid scheme. Don't. If, you, if a friend from school wants to go out for coffee, just say no. And I'll see you next time.